Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Baer, and we have Matthew LaCroix with us. Now, he is on Facebook, The Illusion of Us, and also on YouTube, Matthew LaCroix. He's a regular on the show, and he's probably going to be on here at least once a month as well. He also has a very busy schedule, so it's a real honor to speak with him. And today, we are going to get really deep into the basic 12,000 years of what ifs and what happened 12,000 years ago. The details, what he shared with me off air so far is really exciting. So he's going to put it all together very efficiently for us. And Matt, it's great to speak with you here at The Leak Project. How the heck are you? I'm great, Rex. Thanks so much for having me. I love being back here with you. Awesome. Awesome. So what do you got for us? All right. So today we're going to try to we're going to try to go at uh, our the view of history and understanding the timeline of events that occurred and, and, and how we got to where we are now by looking at not just the stories of the past and not just things that could be misinterpreted, but hard evidence, looking at ice core data from Greenland and looking at, you know, what was left over from these cataclysms and these things that occurred in our past. So we're going to go over between 12 and 13,000 years of history here. And we're gonna to try to review and, and, and figure out the little, the pieces that we've been missing and, and what's maybe caused those pieces to be missing and how they could be kind of gone because of disasters that have wiped them out. And before okay. we start, uh, I wanna give, I wanna give uh, a lot of credit to so many of the, the brave researchers and archeologists who have, who, who have boldly challenged to, to get this information and, um, you know, researchers like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson, and a lot of these researchers who have looked at the geologic evidence, and they've they've ignored what the the mainstream is is trying to force on a narrative, and they and they and they go with what the actual evidence is showing, and and that's what we're about to do right now. And so when I when I was going down this road of truth, um, and starting with starting starting writing and, and starting to figure out where I wanted to research, the thing that really sparked me early on was was the geology aspect as someone who's always been fascinated with the, the physical geography of the world and you know these staggeringly tall mountains and all of these things that occurred that left this imprint of the landscape i was always amazed when i learned in in school about these extinction level events that occurred and, and how extreme they were and as and as i started to go in looking into this further it became amazing that things that i was learning in school later on years later i could look at with fresh eyes and have them be, be completely different and maybe interpreted different and that's what we're going to kind of do right now great all right so so just imagine right now and we have to do that it's important to visualize this type of thing to really get the picture of, of what occurred so let's let's go back in time let's go back in time thirteen thousand years ago during the last great ice age on this planet what was known as the pleistocene era which was a much harsher and colder climate than we have today, where um, snow depths of ice and snow could reach over two miles deep. Where I am right now in Maine, there was snow depths 12,000 years ago that were that was over a mile deep right over my head, right, right where I'm talking. To, th to think about the, the differences between that is just staggering. I'm looking outside the window and I have beautiful green leaves that have just come out and it's a, it's a lush place. But, but it wasn't always like that. And so, but that's important to understand because our climate is what drives everything on this, on this planet to survive. And, and it's what forces things to adapt or change or sometimes disappear in extinctions. Like these large megafauna that we always talk about that roam these northern areas like woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, which vanished in a, in a very short amount of time. And it has left a lot of, a lot of scientists biologists and scratching their heads and trying to figure out how these species that had some of the most resiliency of any species, you know, if you're talking about woolly mammoths who have thick wool coats, thick fur coats, and and they and they were able to survive extremely harsh conditions and, and yet they were wiped out during these these events. And and by and by connecting these type of events and then looking at some of these cuneiform tablets and some of these things we have now these stories that are left from um, from philosophers like Plato, we can then merge the two and kind of try to figure out, do we have amnesia of the, of the past and what really happened? 
So as I said, this timeline is not going to be based simply on stories that can be misinterpreted, but but actual ice core data we're going to look at from Greenland, and we can get a we can get a perspective of more than the last fifty thousand years looking at ice cores, and it's really one of the only places that you can look at objective data that can't really be misinterpreted because it's it's locked in in ice. It's a, it's, a, it's a perfect record of what the climate was like on Earth at that time. So let's begin with with our story here. Let's try to figure out what happened. So our timeline starts roughly 13,000 years ago. And this is the time of when Plato talked about Atlantis, you know, existing and, and when the ice caps around the earth were, you know, two miles deep. And what, what did that cause? Well, it's very important to understand that when you have, you know, there's only a certain amount of water that, that's on earth. It's almost, it's literally the exact same amount of water that's been here for millions of years. And so that water, it has to, you know, it has to go somewhere and, and balance itself. So if you have a large amount of water in ice, then ocean levels are going to be much lower. And that's exactly what happened back then. So back 13, 12, 13,000 years ago, ocean levels were 400 feet lower than they are today. That's more than most buildings in cities. It's, it's enormous, the depth difference of what that is in comparison to now. And of course, most advanced cultures had built along the coast because that's where the it's the smartest place to, to build in terms of readily, readily food available from the sea and trading and all those various things and climate. Of course, unless something like this happens, right? But but this in this image is an actual pyramid. It's a temple pyramid that was found. It's off of Japan, and you can go look and find this stuff. And they actually have tours. Uh, they're expensive, but you can take scuba doing scuba diving tours and go down and see some of these areas. Let me interject real quick. Yeah, it's, go ahead. it's fascinating the information we're getting with these pyramids that are popping up all over the world. I was actually just reading an article today about a pyramid in Peru that's approximately at least 13,000 years old. And this article talked about how advanced the civilization was that built it. Obviously, duh, yet now they're telling the masses, you know, it's funny because people are like, you know, back then they just had slaves and they just had these these hammers and these picks and they put together these beautiful pyramids. You know, it's like, that doesn't make sense. They don't even consider it, do they? No, it's, it's ridiculous because you look at modern technology now and the advancements that we have compared to what it was supposed to be like back then. And architects say, how in the world could we do it now with all the materials used just for the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Cheops Pyramid, just the amount of materials used. They had to get that material from all around the world. And I think that they used frequency type technologies, sound technology to move them. I do too. I agree with that, Rex. You're, exactly. Exactly. Well said. It's, we have these unbelievably massive structures on the earth sitting right in plain sight that is more advanced than we can still build today with what we consider all this advanced you know technology and yet back then they had advanced technology but not like we think of it as they weren't using cranes and all these things like you said they were using what is actually more advanced using frequency and, and sound frequency and all these different things and they would they were able to actually levitate and move stones and all these things that we completely don't understand because like we were saying, like we were saying before, all of that information, all of that knowledge from these advanced civilizations that built all these incredible structures all over Earth was literally lost. It, and it's in some or ways destroyed. It, well, in some ways, the the small amounts that remained was then hunted down to be destroyed. So that the great I call my book the illusion of us, because it represents this illusion we live in where all of our history. And, and the things that make up un our understanding of who we are has been kind of manipulated. It's been this, um, this very calculated manipulation where a certain historical timeline is, is kept in order and, and no one can really go around that. And it's, it's, it's like a perfectly set way to, to control history. And so when we're, looking, when we're looking at things like underwater temple pyramids and Gobekli Tepe and all these sites around the world that don't coincide with anything of what our model model of history is telling us, we have to start asking questions, and we have to and we have to open our mind to the possibility that things are not the way that we've been maybe told. And isn't it funny how a lot of times when people bring up something like Atlantis, they, someone will just start laughing. It's like an immediate reaction to laugh at something that maybe you don't understand or it's been kind of 
put into your subconscious as kind of a joke. But a lot of these things that are real, we have to actually go look for ourselves to understand. And let's do that right now. Let's look at what the real data that breaks us out of just what are stories and really takes us into the hardcore evidence. And what we're looking at right now is a snapshot. It's a snapshot of what the Earth's climate was like over the last around or about the last 20,000 years. And there's some very interesting things you notice, like the fact that when this period of the Younger Dryas ended, just after the gray area, what we would consider kind of a violent climate over the last couple thousand years has been in, the, in, in so many ways stable if you compare to what these events that occur in our past. And that's what we're going to talk about. If you, if you say to yourself, well, I don't really believe in the stories of these big floods that occur in the past and these things that were talked about in these stories because they're too incredible. They're too, they're too far beyond what I can imagine would be possible to happen. But when you look at this and you see that we had plunges in temperatures and rises in temperatures so dramatic that in the course of someone's lifetime, you could see the, the entire transition of planet Earth into a different kind of ecological zone. A time of thrusting us into some of the coldest temperatures we've ever experienced here, you know, in, in the last 100,000 years, to then thrusting us into a rapid, rapid warming. And we have to remember what comes along with those types of events. That represents climate. And this represents telling us where were these temperatures. And those temperatures are going to mimic what kinds of storms existed and what kind of what kind of environment was present on the earth at that time. And when you, when you look at what was present on that time, you see that there were these plunges in temperatures and rises that are coinciding with specific dates. Now this area in gray is what we need to focus on. And I'm gonna bring this chart up again later, um, further on as we get into some more information. But I want you to pay attention to the dates. It's 12,800 years ago to a roughly 11,600 year, years ago. And this represents this cataclysmic period on Earth where these two events occurred. And they've been spoken about in so many different places all throughout history. We haven't really wanted to accept them as being real. But, but we're going we're gonna to show that, show, gonna kind of connect this back and show what, what happened based on the landscape evidence, the geologic landscape evidence that's left behind from them. And then also connecting back to what these Sumerian tablets were trying to say about this time as well. Okay, so let's begin. These ice cores tell us that there was a series of devastating cataclysms that struck Earth. And you can find that by looking at, there's a layer of nano diamonds, which were only created from high impacts, right? This layer of nano diamonds exists right at that soil layer that was 12,800 years ago. So you have this soil layer laid down of nano diamonds. And you also have you also have these ice core samples that are telling us that these, the climate drastically shifted at the same time. So if you put those two things together, you can start getting a picture of what happened back then. And what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about with the, the landscapes and, and these impact areas is showing that we have these, these series of fragmented comets or asteroids that came and struck Earth 12,800 years ago. And, and we have evidence we're gonna look at from the Pacific Northwest of the United States that really paints a great picture for that. And what that tells us is that it, it looks like fragments of a comet or an asteroid struck probably the, the worst place you could imagine. They struck the ice caps in both the Northern ice caps and the Northern hemisphere of the, of the North America, as well as the Northern Asian ice caps. And you can just imagine for a moment, a comet or an asteroid strikes that hit two miles of ice. It's the worst possible thing you could imagine, isn't it? It's, it's, it's like, a, it's like the, a catastrophe you see on some movie on Netflix. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Well, that, that's what precisely happened 12,800 years ago. These, this fragmented comet or asteroid came and, and just slammed, kind of like when we, if, you, if you remember, there was a fragmented uh, comet that struck Jupiter. And everybody, and everybody was watching it, and as it struck, it had the power of like thousands of our nuclear weapons. And so we had these, this fragmented comet or asteroid that struck our northern ice caps. 
and it released this devastating wall of water across the northern hemisphere. And, it, and it's what led to these, these dramatic climate shifts. Because if, you're, if you think about what happens after you have huge impacts, you get a lot of dust in the air, you get a lot of particles that go up. And, that's, and if the, the thicker those particles are, the more you can have that climate violently cool so fast that you can actually cause, you can actually cause mammals to die in, 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 in much faster, um, um, in a much faster sense than we could ever imagine in, in, in any of our understandings. So, and I got to point out that these events that occurred 12,800 years ago are directly related to planet X or Nibiru because they represent, if you think of a bunch of pool, um, think of our asteroid field in our, in our solar system, our asteroid belt, as a bunch of um, pool balls in, in a pool table. And you have like a planet with a massive gravitational field coming through. Even if it's not coming at Earth, it's still going to disrupt all the things that it's going through. And that's exactly what, what Nibiru does. It disrupts everything around it. And sometimes you can get, even before Nibiru even comes, way ahead of it, you can get asteroid and comet strikes. And this was one of the best examples of that we can find in looking at these, into these records of our, these extinction level events that occurred. So let's look at some of the evidence that's left over from what happened, right? These, this wall of water that was released from these massive strikes hitting the ice. And in, in history school, I can actually close my eyes and remember sitting in class, in college, in, in, in my geology class, and learning about this exact area of the Pacific Northwest. And what they used to say was, there were these large buildups of glacial lakes. And when those lakes became too high, they would, they would flow over it and all of a sudden you'd get like an outflow of water and then they would freeze up again and the same thing would reoccur. That's what we're given for, for describing how these massive outflows of water that they, they can't ignore. Places like the Columbian Gorge in Washington, in Washington State is an, exact, is an exact example of how these, these huge gorges were formed. Um, Snake River Canyon and all these areas. These were formed by massive outflows of water, but they weren't from these glacial freeze and thaw sessions like, like they're saying. What, what you actually get to understand is that there are just, there were these massive single events. So these, these ripple waves, and what you're looking at right now is a huge area of the plains out in Western Montana. And as someone who studies geology and looks at this, you can immediately tell something is unusual. You can see mountains in the background, a, a normal mountain range, but all of a sudden you have this, enor this enormous flat plain, right? Like, like there was, you can almost see this massive river that flowed right through it. And then you have these ripples. So if you've ever gone down to a river, or if you've ever been outside during a torrential rainstorm and watched how the water flows, you'll notice that in certain areas, it forms these ripples, these huge ripples that form up from gravel and sand that get built up. And that's exactly what these are, but on a scale that's enormous compared to what we can imagine. We're talking about waves that were hundreds and hundreds of feet tall and, and just flowing through here at such a dramatic rate that they were washing away mountains and washing away entire areas. And so here's another one um, from, from Montana. And again, here you have that area, you, here you have the situation where you have mountain ranges on either side and the water had to go somewhere, right? Just like it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be forced somewhere like a river. And they right. forced down the middle of, of this canyon. And what you have left are, was if you took those hills out, the, the, the ripple hills, it would be a flat, almost a flat bed, like, in, like a river flowed through. But instead, instead of just, be, and, then, and then of course they would say it was a lake, right? Then they would say it was, a, it was an ancient lake. But instead of that, the, the telltale evidence that it wasn't a lake, is that you see these ripples, which only could have occurred from very fast, turbulent water that had flowed over the land. And, and these events, learning about this, this stuff, is, is what made me, uh, is, I have a lot of this actually written in The Illusion of Us, the book I wrote, because it was a big inspiration for me to wanna write, was that we had these incredible events that occurred, and they're being, they're being hidden from us, because they directly link and connect back to the disappearance of so many advanced cultures all over the world. And so if, if those events are directly linked, then that's the very reason why you need to hide them. Everybody likes to roll their eyes when you talk about a conspiracy with hiding something or holding something back, something like in 
how, how could how could history be held back something this big well very carefully and through a lot of very um ruthless and brutal means but we're now just with the with the possibility of having an inter interconnected web and having the evidence right in front of us those of us can, who can know what to look for can can under can finally start to understand why all of these advanced cultures but not only that why all these animals these megafauna why they just disappeared why they just in a blink of an eye these incredible animals just were wiped off the earth and they and of course in our history books we're told that it's because they were overhunted by by natives when they came in but the whole timeline is skewed because they're not considering where things place correctly and that's part of what we need to kind of weed through and that's what we're going to do right now so these space impacts are directly what led to the these massive extinctions during um, the, the younger dryas period it's called these violent times which led to the extinctions of these famous animals like the woolly mammoth the saber-toothed tiger and even like the giant beaver and when we had our, our climate shift so violently that that these these megafauna that existed all over the planet they were they were wiped out in both the northern and the southern hemisphere and here's some amazing evidence if you think about where on earth are these megafauna that existed in the original forms yes there are moose and grizzly bear that still that still that still are around in the northern hemispheres but they're nowhere near the size of what they used to be but there still are these original megafauna in their same the same sizes from these from 12,000 years ago in africa because Africa was the only continent that was in between the northern and the southern hemisphere and was largely less, much less impacted by these events. And so it makes a lot of sense when you start looking at African elephants and you start to say, ah, that's why African elephants survived in just, in just the tropical areas in the central part of the world, whereas its, its cousins in the northern hemispheres all got wiped out in these extinction level events. And and if you've if you looked into some of the some of the things that have happened in the last in the last ten years, they've been finding these woolly mammoths. They've been finding them in, is primarily in Siberia because as our climate is starting to shift right now, it's getting warmer, and a lot of these tundra areas are melting, especially around river areas where where you can have some of these bones, and in some cases a lot more than bones, all of a sudden find themselves to the surface because it's if you think about it. What occurred to these animals during these events was so extreme that it was like throwing them inside an ice, one of those, you know, um, when someone wants to try to extend their life and wake back up again in the future, one of those cryogenic, you know, freezing things. Basically, that's right. exactly what these animals were put into, is, is they had the climate shifted so fast and so rapidly that here you have, the picture right here is, is an actual baby woolly mammoth that was found frozen in Siberia with foods, actual, actual um, food still in its mouth, not even, not even able to be put down its throat. These, 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 these woolly mammoths and these animals lived up in the far northern areas. The, 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 the temperatures and the climate shifted so fast that they literally froze right in place. And so we find these elephants, these woolly mammoths now, and they're talking about wanting to take their genes and bring them back to life because we can reanimate them because we have such incredible genetics because they were flash frozen up there from these specific events that we're talking about. But nobody, nobody likes to talk about that, right? Let me jump in on that real quick. Yeah, go ahead. When they're saying they're thinking about doing it and they've been saying that- They already like, have, right? <laughs> probably 20, 30 years. So would you think they're already doing it? That's right. But, and so here's the amazing thing, is we hear stories and we, about these elephants, these woolly mammoths that were frozen in place and they're so intact and all these things. And yet, if anyone wants to think for a second, the model of what we're given in our, in our history of our climate doesn't, doesn't, that no one talks about how, what event could have created that. What could have caused these animals to be frozen in place? If you think about climate, it occurs over a long period of time, normally. That's what you look at climate over a long period of time to get an idea of averages. We're talking about something that happened in less than a year. We're completely changing the entire climate of the planet. And in some cases, if you're way in the north, like these woolly mammoths were, you get the change in 
in an instant. And movies that people think are crazy where you show these all these flash freezes that have, have happened are kind of trying to tell us something about what about what happened and now imagine if you were if you were an advanced culture and you lived anywhere north of Africa anywhere north of I guess call it call it like um, Mesopotamia and Europe you're gonna be wiped out by this first event you're you're not gonna survive it at all and that's one of the reasons why humanity was almost wiped off the planet from not from one but multiple events in a short amount of time it, very cataclysmic events um okay so we're gonna we're gonna come right back to this again because we gotta look at this again because we're talking about what happened we're looking at how extreme these events were and if we just look at this one more time and you keep these these dates in our in our mind twelve thousand eight hundred years ago this first plunge right you get this first plunge of temperatures that go down to almost the coldest they've been in the last 20,000 years. Right at that, at that one moment, and then you get a, a slight rebound for, you get a less than a thousand year period. And all of a sudden you get this complete other end of the spectrum rise in temperatures where you go, you go three times what it was before in a very, very, very short amount of time. And so what those two events are, are correlate exactly with, with what we're what we kind of think about us as both the great flood but also what, what people aren't really understanding is that there's there were these common asteroid strikes before that kind of let the that kind of set the stage for remember the only reason why these asteroid and comet strikes were occurring was because nibiru planet x was approaching that's why all of a sudden you know 500 year, years later you have a complete re reversal a complete change. I'm sorry, 800 years later, you have a complete change. Um, so th that's because Nibiru then caused a complete re reversal of the temperatures on the planet. All right, so let's look at place, people like um, Plato, Plato, when he talks about in the Critias and the Timaeus, and I, everybody should go read that when he talks about that. He says that Atlantis existed 12,500 years ago or so. Right in the same time period we see right here of all these changes. And he, and he says basically that it was wiped out by cataclysms and there was nothing left from it. It was, it was, there was nothing left that remained of it. Okay. So we got so we kind of think, we think about that and we try, we try to figure out um, what they were all trying to say and what we can put it together to, to see what our timeline, what happened in our timeline. Um, and, and what, and basically what he says is, is that everything that was from Atlantis was destroyed and there was nothing that remained. And so what we have to understand is before Atlantis was destroyed, we gotta bring some more really interesting information. It's not geologic, but it, it's important. Before Atlantis was destroyed, there was competing, competing powers on both the sides of what we would consider evil or dark darkness versus what we would think of as light or knowledge, you know, that in this, this, this kind of, the struggle erupted on Atlantis. And the struggle was revolving around these, these specific types of crystals called Mies. And when we think today about crystals and we look at um, the most expensive watches we still can buy, they're always made of crystalline, crystalline silica. And if we start to understand why that is, you want you and you look at things like well, what makes, what makes that, why is that the case? You know, what's so special about a crystal? What's so, so special about a crystal is that crystals actually have the highest vibration of any element. So already you have something very important that in, if you look at the records of Atlantis in thinking of places like the Emerald Tablets, they talk about how there were these crystals that were harnessed and they were called Mies, M-E, Mies. And whoever had these crystals could essentially harness either great power for good or great power for evil. And during Atlantis, these Mies were, were then harnessed for great evil. And what they did is they, they allowed these portals to the underworld to be opened and all these, all these, um, all these things could be brought into our dimension. And, and so if you read about some of the, some of the strangest aspects you might learn about Atlantis was not only was it, it, it was known that it was going to be destroyed because they could understand geology and understand what was going on, on our planet. 
but that it was allowed to be dis dis destroyed by those who wanted to kind of destroy this dark power that had erupted in Atlantis. So it's kind of amazing now when you look at uh, then places like Egypt, places like Egypt afterwards when these where these Mies, Mies moved into. We're going to talk about that more in a second. So we have to first understand that places like Atlantis were real. You know, that, and that'll be something in the future that we really will come to and we'll, be, we'll study. And Plato, again, he talks about where Atlantis existed. That he, he talks about how it existed west of the Pillars of Hercules. And he says that it, it, was, it was destroyed 12,500 12, years ago or so, during the same time as these, as these cataclysms. And, um, and this is what's kind of gets amazing about it. As Atlantis was sinking and all of these cultures were moving to different places of the world and because and, and, that's kind of how we need to view it. Atlantis didn't just sink in one single event. It kind of was this geological event where the island was breaking off and kind of sinking and people were leaving. And of course, the people who are of the, that, that are controlled, that had controlled the power of the island, this darker power kind of stayed until it went down. And those who were of the serpent knowledge and those who were of the wisdom side, they all left and they all went to different places. Now today, if we look at these different blood types on Earth, like RH negative and RH positive, which a lot of people like to talk about, because it's really interesting evidence that links back to this forgotten time of Atlantis and this dead DNA that was manipulated. If we look at where the highest percentage of Atlantean DNA, you know, RH, the RH negative DNA, where it's found on Earth, it's found in the Basque region that borders Spain and France. And also we can find high amounts of that in places like, in other places in Europe and also in Morocco and in, in Egypt. And when you read about the records of where the people went when Atlantis was, was getting destroyed, that's exactly where they went. So what is this RH factor? What it means is if you, if you have RH negative blood and it's very difficult to get that tested, usually women can only get it tested when they're um, pregnant because um, it makes it makes it so that they're not always compatible during that time. So it's kind of interesting. They're only they only tell them during that time because it's it's very important for health. But the rest of the time, we we only get told our blood type versus A, B, all those different things. But there's a whole other aspect of blood type, and it's this Reese's factor, and you have to get it tested in a very specific way. And what it means is, if you have this Reese's factor in you, your DNA, you are Rh positive. And Reese's is, means it's a similar DNA from the Reese's monkey. And it was a genetic, it was a genetic downgrade to, to people on the planet. That's is to plainly put it that way. Doesn't mean anyone's better or worse than anyone else. It just means they're different. And the people that have RH negative are the still like this pure Atlantean DNA that's still left. And it's very interesting to know that around 80% of the world's population, I would hope everyone would look this up too, 80% of the world's population is RH positive. And only 20% of the world's population, population is RH negative. So I didn't even know. I thought it was more like 15%. Or, or even lower. I mean, it's some of these yeah. numbers are, it's very difficult to know because it's, it's, it's hard to test this because it's kind of one of those things that's hidden. But if you think of it that way, you, you know, I want to add something to the RH negative too, yeah. just because I think it's important. And I have good friends and family members that have the RH negative bloodline. And uh, some, a good friend of mine in particular, she has the extra vertebrae, which looks like a little tell at, you know, on her back almost. And she has a little bit of a cone shaped head. You have to, I mean, it's not like the, the real big cone heads, but a little bit of a cone shape towards the end there. Like in Egypt, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And also, there's um, very strange anomalies connected to electronics and interference with computers. And it's just fascinating the life paths of some of these people that have that specific blood type. It seems like oftentimes more they are seekers of fringe type information, stuff outside of the box. I know a lot of people that listen to Lee Project even have the RH negative blood. And they're like, why do I have this blood? What does it mean? And there's some great connections to that blood type. And also if your parents, like let's say your mom had RH negative, but you were born with the, you know, the positive blood. Well, you could still have that dormant trait of your, of your mom or she could of her mom, etc. cetera. Yes. It, well said Rex. Exactly. And there's a couple of things I want to point out. Um, events in history we think are a certain way are not always like that as 
as we know. Like in World War II, it's very interesting to learn that the Jewish people had one of the highest percentages of RH negative of any people. So you think about the, the eradication of the Jewish people. If you wanted to conquer the world in a new world order where you had people not questioning and just being little workers and dumb, and dumb down little workers, you would want to eradicate the, those bloodlines that have the most trouble. And you, you can see that in, in, in movies and, and throughout um, in a lot of places where they kind of hint at that. They talk about this special bloodline trait that's been carried and moved around. It's very real. And when you look at our world today and how the majority of people have believed this, this artificial version of reality, this illusion of us, this um, matrix of, of everything that kind of been created through thinking we should just work all the time and we're just simple apes and there's nothing special and we should fight each other all the time. That mentality is much more plausible to understand if you realize that 80% of the world is RH positive. It's, or, or more, like Rex said, maybe it might even be, it's like 85%. So it's like a world, it's like a, you know, you have a huge crowd of people and there's just a small number of people that are, are RH negative and you start looking at our society and there's a small amount of people in every group that are kind of more enlightened thinkers and boom, you start to make a lot more sense about why things have been the way they have. And, so, and I, but we have to go even go even further. We have to figure out kind of what happened to all these places and what happened to these cultures that used to all be RH negative and used to kind of protect this kind of serpent DNA. And that's why the modern Kadusha symbol we have still has this intertwined serpents with wings at the top. It's this, this ancient DNA this, that, that they used to affiliate with Enki the serpent and thought that was, that was their family. And we're going to talk about that. So we, we got to move to Egypt. And we were just talking about these amazing structures before the beginning of the show. And when Thoth and all, all, these, um, all these factions that were part of knowledge and the snake they all left and they dispersed into different areas and Thoth and, and many that were loyal to him, they went to Egypt. And that's why we have these advanced cultures that all of a sudden kind of spring up out of Egypt. And in, 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 in the Emerald Tablets, Thoth talks about how he brought, had, had these crystal, one of these me crystals was in the Great Pyramid of Giza. So you have this massive energy pyramid that's tuned to the harmonic frequency that, of a human being. And you have this crystal, this massive crystal inside it, these tremendous powers. I and mean, what could you accomplish with something like that? And then what could you accomplish is specifically the point. We then, knowing these, these great Anunnaki beings, these great beings that have given humanity knowledge all throughout our time period, shown by the, the pine cone and all these different symbols that try to show, you know, awakening us and giving us all this knowledge. They are, they're, they're obviously so advanced that they know exactly what's happening all around us. They know what's happening in the cosmos. They know what's happening with specific events. They can plan everything out. And they knew that Nibiru was coming back. They knew that these cataclysms that have occurred, we just talked about with these, these comet fragments that have slammed into these ice caps, you know, 800 years before. They knew that that was the precursor to something very bad that was coming. And What's amazing is if you look at all of these advanced monolithic and pyramid structures, um, and some of them are older, but if you look at the large majority of them all over the planet, most of them are from this golden age, this very, very short time period from about, from about 12,500 years to about 11,600 years. It was a small time period where they're all squeezed in. Um, all these massive advanced cultures were built and all of these incredible structures were built like they knew that time was running out, right? I, I figured out as I was going that the only reason why they had sped this up and did all this so fast from, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is Baalbek, Lebanon, from, from, you know, Lebanon and Mesopotamia and, and then southward to Africa and then all the way in Patagonia, all the way east through Turkey and all the way to um, China and, and Japan and then southward to Cambodia, Thailand, and all those areas. It's all from the same group of beings and knowledge that was spread in a very short amount of time because they knew if they didn't, that we, we would never be here today. That these, these, uh, these monuments and this knowledge that was, that was built during this time period was the only thing that would remain from what was gonna be 
one of the most catastrophic events that, is, that has occurred on the earth in the last 50,000 years. And so they knew that this event was coming. And the only way to, to protect it, the knowledge to actually survive. If these things weren't here today, we would be completely enslaved right now. Or we wouldn't even be here. We would have annihilated ourselves from so much confusion and various things. These structures and the knowledge that was left over from these, these civilizations that was built is the only thing that survived so that we could actually know the truth of not only who we are, but the great teachings that carried before us. Where do you think that Socrates and, and Plato and then his, his great teacher Socrates got us their information from? It's all Egyptian knowledge. If you look at connections with Plato, you can see that he had strong connections with Egyptian knowledge. He studied Egypt, Egyptian, extensively studied Egyptian knowledge. It's all part of the same thing. The ancient Freemasons, all of, with the obelisk we see in Washington, D.C., all of these things are from the same advanced knowledge. It's from this, this, this snake knowledge of, of, you know, that's why in, all throughout Mesoamerica you see this worship of, of the plumed serpents, the snake and the dragon. It represents this family knowledge of enlightenment, where they wanted to spread knowledge all over the earth, but there was, there's another side that didn't want that, and that's what we're going to go into in a little bit, is explain that that's why after these things were then remained to be hidden, or war was then created in those areas to destabilize them so that people could never find them. A lot of these monuments you can't even visit today, they've been closed off because of war. Isn't that very interesting that we now can't get access to some of the sites that are the most important we have? Um, when, so to go to continue on this timeline, after Egypt and, and, and this whole, the whole Mesopotamia uprising of civilizations, Thoth was actually kicked out of Egypt by his brother Amun-Ra, known as, also known as Marduk, because they had disagreements over the lunar versus the solar calendar. And if you, if you learn, if you look at today, obviously it's, it's a solar calendar and Thoth had a lunar calendar. And so he ended up getting kicked out of Egypt and he left and he ended up ending up in, um, in the United States as the first location. And there's some really interesting connections you can see with the Hopi where they talk about the Pleiadians and how these Anunnaki Thoth and those who were from this side of the dragon, the snake, had actually even maybe worked with them genetically to create what we think of as the Anasazi and eventually the Aztec people. And what we're looking at right here, and it, that's why it's so amazing, it's all connected. It's all part of the same story. This is Chaco Canyon. And um, in Chaco Canyon, built by the Pueblo, you see extremely similar um, uh, designs to Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which they where they align ex exactly to true north, and they have all these constellation precision where they where they were following all these different um, astronomical uh, precise alignments. They all had the same knowledge. It all came from somewhere, and it came from the same place. And so when we move from places like Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde in the southwest, we can start to kind of understand how the, the knowledge was able to jump from Mesopotamia and, and Turkey and in in Asia and get and get all the way over to to the Americas right and it's, it's really interesting that the the god of the Americas specifically south the god of South America was named Amaru and so it was it was it was actually called the land of Amaruka so think about the name America you can see that it's simply just a playoff of Amaruka and which was a, the serpent god of the Inca and so it's, that's what's so interesting about it all being kind of all connected. It's an amazing story. And what we got to understand is that this planet, that this forgotten planet that we've, planet X, right? That's been out there, that's, protru that's protruded the, you know, we, we see evidence of it based on our outermost planets being their, their, their gravitational um, movements is protruded by this object that's out there in space. And you can see that it's very, it's very easy to look at if you look at it in data. And so these ancient cultures of the past knew that these events occurred, occurred every 3,600 years. So this building of underground structures to survive was, was, like a, was a common occurrence for them. And it's just, we don't understand that now. And so, so we look at sites, we look like Darren Kuyu in Turkey, and you can see these massive underground places where people had to take shelter during these cataclysms every 3,600 years. But they were not all the same. And that's something we're going to talk about at the end of the show is how the different passes in Nibiru can, and Planet X can cause differences in these events on Earth. So one of the, one of the most ancient of these, of these uh, 
ancient people of the United States, these native, native people. The Hopi and the Pueblo go back to probably our most ancient records we have. And they talk about how they were led into these caves by these people, these beings that came down from the heavens. They say they came out of a cloud and they came down to them and they called them the ant people. And they, 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 and there's all of their ancient legends and stories. They say they were led into these caves to survive these cataclysms. And that's the only reason why they survived. So you can begin to understand how they would be connected to, to cultures like the Aztec, which isn't very far away to the south. Um, and as, as I said, uh, some of these places like Darren Kuyu in Turkey, they had these massive round stones where they would have to roll them in front of the door to, to, to protect themselves when these waves would go through. And these horrible disaster situations would occur on, on the planet. And of course, if you study advanced, if you, if, if you study how an advanced um, culture would be the safest in the cosmos from all the different things that occur, underground is always the safest means. It's how you would survive anything. And of course, Rex knows with all these underground bunkers that are being built right now at this very time by secret government things and all these people that are freaking out, it's all the same thing. It's simply the ancient building underground, except now it's just more modern. And, but I'd like to strongly point out to um, that this pass is, is from all my data is not going to be the same kind of pass that occurred uh, 11,500 years ago or so around that time. It's not the same because it depends on where it passes through. And so this, um, when we talk about the story of what happened to us, this is what, when you start putting those, those ice core samples, right? You start putting these, these Sumerian cuneiform tablets of stories together and you start understanding what happened. It starts to really make sense. And, and our story, uh, when, and then once you start putting that together and you learn about Enlil, who is also known as Zeus, and you learn about Enki, his, his half-brother, also known as Poseidon, and how they've been, and, and all the family members affiliated with them, with their ideology, have been, has been kind of represented by this, this kind of eagle and serpent battle all, all throughout history. And, and, I, and I've showed that in some other shows. I have, I have a show I did with Rex called The Eagle and the Serpent. We, we talk extensively about that, so check that out as well. But So what that means is, there have been these opposing factions for how humanity should have it, how its outcome should be. We talked about the Reese's gene a, a, a little bit ago. That relates to how our genetics were genetically manipulated, not once, but many multiple times, to ultimately get, be a downgrade. The, the Reese's factor represents a downgrade. And it was, the, it was the last genetic manipulation that was done on humanity. And it was done for, for reasons so that people would literally be better workers and would not be questioning all of the truth and they could keep this false paradigm going because Enlil, with, Enlil has always been this supreme commander over the planet. If you think about ownership of, of a real estate of a planet, he's always been the supreme kind of leader of this. And you can read all of this in the Sumerian tablets. Just read about what they, what they talk about with these, with these various gods. These, they're, they're Sumerian gods. And all Anunnaki simply means is those who from heaven came to earth or those who from Anu were sent to earth. So we have like these, these strange stigmas, stigmas that sometimes apply to certain amounts of information until we actually understand what that means. Like, oh, that's like silly. All it, all it means is it's the earliest, our earliest advanced culture, the Sumerians, those gods they spoke of were known, they called them the Anunnaki. So we gotta, we gotta be very careful not to let any stigma of information hold us back from just going through and following truth no matter where it leads, objectively. And saying, okay, who are these gods of history? Who are these gods of every culture that has kind of engineered and kind of governed them? And it's interesting to learn about these Anunnaki, this Anunnaki culture and how they have a, a, a male-dominated kingship, war-dominated kingship, and how kingship is talked about in the Bible, how it was lowered from heaven. So what we see on earth is simply just a reflection of of kind of their governing tactics so the reason i'm saying all this is when we get back to our story about how humanity was at the very edge of being wiped out we had this first event with these these comet fragments right with these massive waves that wiped out anyone in the northern and southern hemispheres and so you have these the remaining people that were living in the central part of <clears throat> of the world mesopotamia and africa and in all a lot of parts of asia and 
Here you have this second event coming that's much worse on a scale that is not even, I mean, on a scale where if you were not able to take shelter or some other means, which we'll talk about, you will be, you will die. You will be wiped off the earth. And so, and so when we, when we look at decisions that were made by this being right here known as Enlil and how, because he had the idea that they genetically manipulated and created us out of Neanderthals, that they had the right to then destroy us. And then other, like remember the brother I mentioned, Enki, doesn't have the same feelings as that because he's the one that actually created us. So we're like his children. So that's a very important struggle to understand because when we look at this flood occur coming, this disastrous Nibiru pass, when we talk about different passes, we're gonna go over at the end of the show, this pass is as close as it, it, it can get for Nibiru pass and it will be as bad as it can get. So they knew that and they all left or and then they sent the great you know the great nephilim of our planet the great giants went into caves and they knew all these caverns deep within the earth and they and the remaining humanity there was a pact that was made with enlil and all his, the various great anunnaki where they had made a pact where they weren't allowed to tell humans so when we start looking at our importance you know these great beings that were genetically created and secretly all these gifts were put in by enki and we we ended up being these great great beings that are like, almost like perfect beings if you look at us, we're light beings of perfection. This great jealousy from these other, from like Enlil and those Anunnaki who as gods to us, almost feel like, and he used to call us beasts. So they, that's why you understand the idea that on how some of these gods might hate us and might, might think of us as, as simply beasts that should never be allowed to exist. So here you have this great flood coming and they knew it was coming and they made a pact to not, and, and you can read all about this and we're gonna talk about where you can read that. And, and they, they, so they made a pact about that. And where can you read about that? You know, am I just making all this crazy stuff in my head just because it sounds good and, and I like really awesome stories? No, I don't, I, I don't go tell, say anything unless I find it from evidence, from objective research over years of studying and looking at, well, what do these, what do these cuneiform tablets say? Well, what do the geologic records say? And then what do, what do the soil say, samples say and all these things and you combine them and you can get an idea of what happened. And what is a cuneiform tablet? Not everybody knows what it is. It represents the oldest writings we have on the earth. If anybody was to write on paper or something like that, it would disintegrate, it wouldn't make it. So these writings that are put into stone or clay are the only thing that would survive. So if you wanna know this truth of what happened in our history, you have to look at our oldest writings. In our oldest writings, almost all come from the Sumerians. That's why, very much why, so many um, wars have occurred in Iraq because Mesopotamia is simply Iraq and in the Syria area and all that. That area is is the, is the cradle of ancient civilization. So what in front of you is this is called the Atrahasis cuneiform tablet, and. There's a very polluted term we have called with the name called uh, the name of Noah, and what's very interesting people don't realize is that story has been turned into a silly myth, much like Atlantis. But when you start digging into it, you learn that it's not a myth at all. And in fact, every advanced culture all over the planet, from Africa to like we said, the Hopi in the, in northern North, in North America, all the way to in China, they have stories of these floods, these this or this specific massive flood that occurred. In the, in the past, and they all recorded that down. And of course, unfortunately, much much of it didn't make it. But they but they a lot of it was kept in stories, and a lot of them still tell those stories. And what this is is this is called the epic of the epic of Atrahasis. And Atrahasis was was the name of Noah. That's actually his real name. His name was Atrahasis or Zayasudra. And so Noah is like this name that's kind of like I like to consider it one of these these polluted terms. Things like alien, God, pyramid, Noah, all these things are terms that um, we've been subconsciously trained so that anytime they're said, it's immediately ridicule, ridiculed and turned into a joke because those are those terms reflect something that is very real. But we just have to realize objectively what's real and kind of separate what's been kind of turned into a myth. So in the Epic of Atrahasis, it's a story of Noah. That's all it is. So go read the story of Noah because he's one of the only human beings that survived to tell it. And in, in the story of Atrahasis, you 
you find out that he is a son of Enki. He has the, the DNA of the gods. And Enki, as his son, secretly tells him that this flood is coming through visions and all these things. And he creates this very specific cedar-built boat that could, that could survive this massive flood. And of course, nobody else on Earth knew anything about that. And there's no boats like that that, could, that were designed like that. So everybody perished. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Maybe, who knows, how, we don't actually know how many people were alive at that time. But there were only a handful of people on the entire planet. And almost all of humanity was wiped out. Just think about that for a moment. We can't even put our, wrap our heads around that. But people like the, the Hopi, who were led into the caves and in and, and small groups that, were, that survived. And of course, Atrahasis and his family and some, and some of the genetics that were preserved. That's what it is. Like instead of animals, we need to think of genetics. It all comes down to simply just DNA, right? To then start things over again. So we, if we think now about all these things, they start to really make sense. And they come together in a whole different light. Whereas in, look, in looking at that ice core symbol from Greenland, you see these events that occurred where this flood of, of, of this time period with, with Atrahasis led to a rapid warming after. And then, which is, which is what led into the Holocene, this warmer, warmer time period we're in now. And so the only reason why, um, the only reason why uh, Atrahasis Noah was spared, you know, of course, Enlil was furious after he found out humanity had survived because the very idea with not telling them was that he wanted this experiment to be wiped out. That's so profound to wrap your head around. All of what we have around us today, every future we have that's existing right now would have not been possible. He wanted us to be eradicated like an ex the extinction of a species like the woolly mammoth. We'd be gone forever. And, and because of only very minute things at the very nick of time, and because of the importance of how important of how we are, the, we are very important for the future. That's what's important about this, is Enki and what secretly saved you know, Atrahasis and, and, and allowed so many other people on Earth to survive like the Hopi and all these different things. It's all part of these, these great beings that don't want humanity to be, to be wiped out because there's a certain probable future they see for us. And so they want this, this, this idea of helping us at certain times while there's another side that doesn't want to help us and they kind of try to keep us asleep. And there's always been that, that battle, that struggle back and forth. So let's get more and more real here. Let's, let's bring these things that are myth and let's bring them to fact. Where did Noah land in all these mythical stories? Well, he landed on Mount Ararat, Ararat in Turkey. Mount Ararat is, an ex, is, a, is a massive volcano that happens to be the largest mountain anywhere around it. If you go to Google Maps and you look at terrain, go look at Mount Ararat. It's incredible. It's the only volcano in its entire area. So if you were to think of Atrahasis in this massive cedar boat, and as the waters are receding from this by the way, we didn't even talk about what happened. As Nibiru was passing, it caused, it caused a terrible pole shift on the Earth and, and led to this bulging of the ocean that's, that occurs at our, at our equators to essentially flood over the entire planet. The entire planet. Everyone wiped it, washed away. That's why all of these things disappeared. And all, all that was left was just these remnants of pyramids and these things that were able to survive because everything else was wiped away. And so... Atrahasis lands on Mount Ararat, and that's where kind of the story then begins of we get, we get given agriculture again, and then we have to kind of start over again, right? And it becomes the perfect place to create this illusion of us here. Like I write in my, in my book, that's what the entire book's about. This artificial history that was then created where at that point, if, if everything of the past, right, all these amazing things are nearly wiped away, all you have to do is create stories that reflect what those structures are and you can kind of manipulate the entire rest of it because all the rest is gone. We literally have amnesia. It's like someone, it's like someone all of a sudden losing their memory and they don't know anyone that exists that they've known their entire lives. That's exactly what happened to us. We lost everything we had. And so we, we, this picture is showing you off of, off of Egypt some of these ancient cities that are underneath the ocean. When, so when, as the, as the, uh, we showed the climate, these rapid fluctuation of temperatures, as the temperature coming into the Holocene, as the Younger Dryas ended 11,600 years ago, we had this massive rising of temperatures and, and much of the ice caps melted. 
and led to the end of the Ice Age. That's what led to the end of the Ice Age, these, these multi-pronged two events. And then, of course, all this water melted and it had to go somewhere, the same amount of water on the Earth, so then it raised ocean levels 400 feet, and much, that's what's so brilliant about it. It's so easy to cover most of this up because most of these ancient things are still under the water. And people, it's very difficult for people to get down to these because they're so deep. And you have to have specific scuba licenses and all these things that you know, only a certain small amount of, of society can actually even know about them. And so the great illusion of keeping all this stuff hidden is very easily constructed by simply by the fact that most of it's underwater. Um, and so this is, this is what the great being of Zeus or Enla looks like. And of course, furious of what occurred with humanity surviving. Remember, he wanted us eradicated. They decided to create a, a, a very, very clever system that was known in, in, throughout the universe, a very clever way to manipulate a species to put them in a total slavery by, inst by creating through laws and instigating money, creating an artificial currency that's not even real. To, you can literally create what we think of as this matrix of, of everything we live in. And then generations of people, of course, didn't know anything about all this stuff. And it slowly was eroded. And then that's what we have today, where parents don't pass down knowledge of ancient history. They just pass down kind of more simplistic things. And slowly we've been eroded to the fact that we don't, we don't know anything or, or the importance of, of what we are. And great gods like, like Zeus here have forced us into this paradigm through war and all these different things run through the eagle. You can see embroidered all flags and, and crests everywhere where they, where they were able to essentially control the world through keeping them in an illusion through fear and not ever allow this stuff out. And, and so we get to the part where we talk about where are we right now? All, all of a sudden now we're entering a time like the Mayans have spoken. I just got back from visiting Chichen Itza and, and actually, if you go to the, um, the Illusion of Us on Facebook, I posted some incredible pictures where I found this connection that I don't believe had been made where it showed both the eagle and the serpent um, kind of fighting and it had an eagle with a pineal gland and, or, or seed of life in its mouth, seed of knowledge in its mouth. And, and I and directly coincides with all these things all over the planet with this battle that had been occurring with these gods. And I, I posted all those and I'm, it's, it's amazing to be able to visit these sites in person and see this stuff. Because if you know what you're looking for, there are a lot of things that have been missed or have been hidden and not have been, been allowed to be told. So people like researchers like us who can go there can find that. And so when I was there, I got to see things like Kuku Khan's Temple Pyramid, in which every single step represented the different levels of consciousness. There are nine levels. And they talk of the Mayans talk about how we've reached that ninth level now, which is universal consciousness. And that's why all this information is exploding. It's like you can't keep it, the lid on the pot that's boiling any longer because we're reaching this time when this veil, they called it a veil of Ka, is, is starting, the Egyptians did, is starting to be eroded around us where we're all of a sudden kind of waking up to the truth of all these things and we're doing everything differently and everything's changing. At the same time, Nibiru is passing again. Either it's going by at some point I think uh, by this fall. And what a very interesting thing I got to point out and talking about all the research I've looked at is depending on the type of pass that Nibiru makes, it can be a devastating pole ship pass with asteroids and all these various things, or it can be somewhat of a, a benign pass. Most importantly, remember, these events we were talking about occurred 11, 12,800 years ago to 11,500 years ago. That means there would have been another Nibiru pass since then, right? and it wasn't talked about in, in any cultures, which tells you that it wasn't a destructive pass. And that shows you that based on the calculations of where this is, and based on all, on all the information I've seen on where it is related to the sun and our earth, is that this will be, that's why the Mayans and all of these ancient cultures have planned for this time now, because this time was a calculated time when it wouldn't be a devastating pass. And we would be allowed to go through great changes there's going to be, there's going to be, there's already geological events with volcanoes and earthquakes all over the planet. But what I mean, we're comparing like extinction level events. So we're still going to get disruptions, but the disruptions are going to simply be a catalyst towards kind of our entering into this new time. And what is that time? Well, 
One of the reasons why all of these things were allowed to happen. After this pass occurred, this devastating pass 11,500 years ago and led to this kind of amnesia restart. Why was that so negative? Why was, why was this so dominated by war? Well, that's simply because these Anunnaki gods take turns on who rules here. And we gotta understand is this time we were in was known as the time of Pisces. And it was a, it was a negative polarity energy. It, it, it means that everything in the cosmos is a balance. And so it was allowed to be a negative polarity as part of our development. And it did, and as, as you can see. And so now as we enter this new time, like, like the Mayans have said, and, and everything in their, and all religions talk about this, this time that's gonna happen. And it represents us going into our galactic center where we enter this time of Aquarius, which represents the complete opposite. It's in positive polarity where Enki and, and those loyal to him are going to be able to have control. And so that's how this struggle is always undergone. And so now it makes total sense on why you see this kind of older power holding on and fighting for the last scraps, whereas the rest of humanity is trying to move on at the same time to this kind of new place where they can kind of like just look at fear and all these events that are occurring and these things that try to hold us back with everything around us and kind of um, move, move above it and move beyond it. And um, please, please look into uh, my YouTube video. I make a lot more, a lot more content like this where we talk about different aspects of this because the story is so complicated. It's so big that it's very difficult to try to take it all in unless you study it in pieces. So I try to write the illusion of us around basically a starting guide from beginning to end on what happened to us. What happened in our history? What's happened in our consciousness? and what has kind of happened with this illusion of our world around us and trying to tie it together and then lead to some of these more, just then of course there's more advanced authors like Gerald Clark, who, who if you want to learn anything about the Anunnaki and, and about what their, their whole system of hierarchy was, that's where you can then move to. But people, there's so much information to go over that we need to have a, a, an understanding of where things fit in with the timeline. Absolutely, I would agree. And, you know, you bring so much good information to the table, Matt. I definitely look forward to speaking with you again soon. And your Facebook page is The Illusion of Us. YouTube is Matthew LaCroix. And are there any other ways to get access to your book? I mean, what's the best way to purchase your book? Um, well, just currently, um, it's in a few bookstores, but Amazon is going to be your, your best bet for getting it. And I, I appreciate any support. Um, I'm just someone who just does this as a hobby. I'm a researcher as a hobby, or I just, I just, I know how important this information is. And I really believe that everybody deserves it. And so I try to, I try to bring it all together um, with as much objective research truth that, that I can, that I can based on, you know, learning from these philosophers who have, who have tried to tell us the, the conscious, the conscious mindset that needs to be present for, for our, future here so i've been trying to follow a lot of these ancient teachings to try to bring them bring them into the present so thank you so much rex i really appreciate it absolutely thank you matt ladies and gentlemen check out matthew lacroix on youtube and facebook also check out leakproject.com we have exclusive content on there for premium members i also want you guys to check out these really cool bivy sacks that we offer these things are literally small enough to fit in the palm of your hand and they're good for everybody's car. Have it in a bug out bag, have it in your cap camping bag, have one under your bed. If you're going on a road trip and it's cold outside, if your car veers off the side of the road and you need to stay warm for a while, I'll tell you, this thing could help save your life. So check it out, Quick Bivy. I will leave a link in the video description box. Thank you for being here with us. That is my quick shameless plug. Question everything, ladies and gentlemen, and be the change you want to see.